Hello folks, welcome to the Age of Asparagus in part 7 of making a 3D top-down shooter in Godot. By the end of this video, the player will be able to die after running out of hit points from enemy attacks. We'll also tweak the enemies in a few places so they don't overlap while resting, and so they still attack you even if you try to hide right in front of them. So the first thing I'd like to clean up here is that the enemies, they overlap during their resting phase, like that. And my intention was for them to overlap to be able to get to the resting phase, but once they reached it, they would need to collide again. So we obviously put something in the wrong spot here. So let's go back to our enemy scene and we'll go to the enemy script. And we set collide with other enemies to true after we've set their state to resting. But the problem here is when they're in the resting state here, uh, they don't move. They don't move and slide anywhere. And it's actually the slide portion of move and slide that prevents them from overlapping. It detects the collision and slides them along in whatever direction uh, based on that collision. So we need to actually slide them very slightly here which we can do. We can go, we can just do a little move and slide right here. And we're just going to move and slide nowhere. So we'll give it the zero vector. And if we do that, we should now, let's see if we can get them to do it. There we go. That's what we want. We don't want them overlapping. Um, that was a little weird. They should not be overlapping. <laughs> There's another little bug here, but I think I'm gonna leave this for now. And that is the collision is actually only detected when they enter the area. So if they're all, see those two there? See, they're already in the area, then they don't actually detect the entry into the area until they've gone out of it again, if that makes any sense. Um, but one thing, other little tweak I wanna make to the enemy is the collision mesh. I would like them to overlap a little bit. So let's go to the collision shape here and I'm gonna hit seven to go into top view. And I just wanna bring it in slightly inside the actual mesh. Now we're not gonna be able to see it as well unless we turn off the mesh instance, there it is. So the pill's a little bit smaller. So it just is gonna give them a little bit of a more squishy look so they can at least, um, here let's, take a look with lots of them. Yeah, see there you can see them overlapping a little bit. Yeah, more like that. Maybe I could make it a little bit bigger, but now they're not so hard surfaced. Okay, the last piece of new functionality we're going to add to this phase of the project before we move on to phase two, which is going to be about random level generation, is we need to allow our player to take damage and die. So let's go to the player scene. I'm going to open that up. And we're gonna add a stats node to that player. And I'm just gonna drop it in. And you can change the hit points if you want. I'm gonna leave it at 10. And if we click on the stats script, you can see here, just a reminder, that the stats node can take damage. It'll track damage. And when the hit points are reduced to zero, it will die. And dying will cause the node to emit a you died signal. And if we wanna queue free our player, then we're gonna to have to connect to that signal on the player. But let's start at step one, which is we need to be able to take damage. So we're gonna do that from our enemy scene. And in our enemy script, let's go to where the enemy is moving and attacking. So they move and attack. And we probably wanna do the damage when they've actually reached the target, right? So that's gonna be here when the distance is within one unit of the target and if the current state is attacking and before they start returning we're gonna do damage right here do damage to the player so to do that we're gonna need the player stats node so let's from the player we already have a reference to the player we're gonna get node and we're gonna get the stats node and that doesn't make sense so we actually want to name our new variable player stats and we're going to set it equal to the uh, stats node and let's just tell it that this is a going to be a stats object that way when we go player stats we should be able to take a hit yep there we go and we'll just do one damage for now 
And if you remember the take hit method, if we go back to the player, uh, if we go back to the stats script, you can see the take hit method takes one parameter for damage, and it applies that damage to the current hit points. Whoa, actually, we just hard-coded one there. Let's make that damage. So now it'll do that amount of damage to whoever owns this stats node. Okay, I'm going to save that. Go back to the enemy. Player gets damage. And let's just uh, a little sanity check. When it's hit, the enemy will say, I hit you. This is kind of weird to be doing this in the, um, in the enemy script, but it's just uh, out debugging output for us to make sure everything's working. And we'll go player stats since we already got it. Dot current hit points. Um, and then we'll add a slash here. And then the other variable will be the max hit points, player stats dot max hit points. Okay, let's see if that works when the enemy is instance. Okay, so let's see, it should take damage. Uh, too many things are happening right now. Let's uh, control shift F, print, and get rid of all this print stuff that I'm doing. So we can control K that. We don't need that. We don't need, that's already out. Let's leave those. Enemies killed this wave, that's probably still useful. Ooh, we can probably delete a whole bunch of that stuff. Okay, now, whoops. Where, where did I mess up? Um, print resting, oh, okay, let's just pass. Because resting doesn't do anything right now, it does, uh, except for rest. Let's run that again, and when they do damage, I'm hit, I take nine damage, eight damage, seven, six, five, good, damage, okay, so, we just need to die now when we run out of hit points. So the stats node, uh, if we go to the stats script, is going to emit a signal when our hit points reach zero. And if we go up to the node, we should see the you died signal. We're going to connect that to our player, the player script on stats you died signal will be the method. And for now, um, we'll just queue free. We can say game over because <laughs> they have one life. Woo 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 free. All right. And now, um, let's see if that, how fast that horde can kill us. The horde. Here we go. We're dead. We cute. Oh, we died. But the problem is, uh, when we die, uh, did we die? Did it say you died? Yeah, it said game over there. So we got, um, the problem is the enemies are still trying to find the player. And when it goes to try and find this player, it doesn't exist anymore. So we need to deal with that. We need to go uh, find all the references to our player and check that the player still exists. So let's do that. Let's uh, let's go to this one uh, on path timer timeout. So let's first check if there is a player. So I'm gonna go if player. Now, if the player doesn't exist, if we've Q freed it, then the player variable is gonna be null. And if you remember, Previously, null is one of those falsy values in GDScript, so I can just say if player, which means <laughs> if the player is anything that is truthy, not null in other words, then run this code, right? And we should probably just um, look where other places that we have the player that is going to break our game when we delete it. Um, so here as well, move and attack, seeking, hmm, you know what? We can just avoid all of this because the enemy doesn't need to do anything once the player is dead. So let's tab intent all that and we're only gonna do this if there's a player. Now we should probably, uh, once we add a UI and a start screen and stuff, we'll probably add another state machine -y thing that will tell us what state the game is in, whether it's paused or stopped or started or game over. But for now, we're just going to cover our butts uh, for when the player is deleted. Okay. Um, where does this occur? If body equals player on attack radius body entered, well, that shouldn't be able to happen anymore because the player is dead here. So that's not a problem. Um, here the mouse cursor is still going to be looking for the player and we're not going to worry about that anymore once the player is dead so we'll just tab intent all that and we'll go if player uh, player doesn't exist so we want to go 
if player. Now, this is a case where every frame it is getting in the node that is the player and that is a little bit expensive and also it's getting a little clunky here so let's create a onready var player equals player that should be a capital P because that's the name of the node and here now we can use player there and instead of finding the player again we'll just use the player variable okay did that fix everything up one way to find out let's die from our it worked there we go game over so a uh, odd problem I noticed when I was just happened to be testing this code out on a slightly di different version of Godot. I'm using 3.2.3 .3 here, but on another computer, I think it was 3.2.1, but I don't know if that's the reason I was having the problem, but I was getting an error when I was trying to check if the player existed still. And instead of being null or some other falsy value, it actually turned, when I printed it to the console, it showed up as a deleted object something like that and uh, I couldn't find anything in documentation about this but I figured I should mention it in case other folks are having issues and since it's not documented maybe I'll just go with a more reliable version of checking if the player still exists and we can use the method is is instance valid and if we put the player inside that then we can check if the player is still a valid object and we can do that control shift F I'm just gonna check if player colon here we use that a couple times so on 36 here and I'm just gonna replace with is instance valid where is this one good and we already got that one okay so the three places where we did it also an issue you may have noticed is that after they attack us if they're still within our radius like this they stop moving. That's because we only trigger that attack signal when the character enters the attack radius of the enemy. And since the character is already inside the attack radius, well, um, this enemy doesn't know what to do. It's just it's as close as it's gonna get to the node, to the path that it's trying to reach, and it's just gonna stay there. And it will only attack again if I leave and re-enter like this. But if I stay around, weird things happen. So let's fix that, that shouldn't be too hard. So let's go to the enemy script, enemy.gd here, and if we scroll up to here, the physics process where we are seeking. So if we're in the seeking state, we're gonna check if the current node is valid within the path, then we're gonna get a direction, vector three. Um, I'm gonna clean this up too, I don't like, <laughs> I don't know why I called this direction, maybe I'll call this the, um, seeking vector oops seeking vector if I'm calling something a direction really it should be normalized it should just it's a better naming convention if your directions are normalized vectors and your distances and lengths are just scalars so then we can get the seeking vector dot length and the seeking vector dot normalized would be the seeking direction right Okay, that just, when I'm reading the code, that makes more sense to my brain. Another odd thing we're doing here, now that I'm looking at it, is if we're close, there's kind of like we skip this frame in the movement to update the node to go to the next node, and then we keep moving again, which seems a little weird. Uh, this probably doesn't need to be in the else section. In fact, we probably wanna move first. We're gonna move, and then after we move, we want to see how close we are, right? So we should probably update the seeking vector after we move, and we're gonna set it to the same thing, except now, of course, after we moved a tiny bit for that one physics frame, our global transform.origin, so our position in global space, will have changed slightly. Now, if our new position after moving is has a distance of less than one, to its target, then we'll increase to the next node in our path. So let's just check and make sure we didn't break anything there. Okay, so good, it's following its path, it's attacking, that's good. And uh, they come back, and oh look, they keep moving around a little bit, they don't just stop moving. Um, that's good, but they don't attack us, and that's a problem. So what we wanna do here, then, is 
we want to check if we're close to the player. And if we are, then we want to attack. So we already actually have a really nice way of checking if we're close to the player. And that is because our enemy has an attack radius, right? Which is hard to see here, but there it is. This little ring is our attack radius. And because this is an area, the attack radius, it has a collision shape, but the attack radius is an area node, we can use a method to see if any other bodies overlap with our area. So let's go back to the enemy script here and let's check if the attack radius and then the method is here overlaps body. So it's a physics body. We're seeing if we overlap with the player, which is a kinematic body. So, and we already have a variable that holds the player. So if attack radius overlaps the body of the player, then we want to attack. Um, so currently we're attacking here when the player enters the attack radius, but that's only when it crosses the border of the attack radius. The current situation we're in is if it's overlapping with the attack radius. And overlapping is going to run at the same time as this, which means we don't actually need this signal anymore. We don't need to check if the player's body enters the attack radius because we're already going to catch that here when it overlaps with the attack area. So what we can do is instead, I'm just going to actually rename this method and we'll call it instead, we'll just call it init attack. And we're not going to need a body anymore because we're only going to call it if it's something it can attack like the player. We can probably get rid of that and we can tab all this shift tab, all of this in and let's get rid of the attack radius signal. So I'm going to click the little signal icon here or you can go over to the attack radius and the node. I'm going to select the green signal there and disconnect it. Otherwise we'd get an error that it couldn't find the uh, connection, couldn't find the method that it was trying to connect to that we just changed the name of. And back to the enemy script. Now we'll just initialize that attack. When right here. And we're using player here, but we're already checking if it's a valid instance um, before we run this code. So we should be good. Let's see if that gives us a little bit better effect here. Okay, so attack goes back, comes green, attacks again, attacks way better. Okay, so look, now they're just gonna keep attacking us and get closer and closer if we don't move, and I'm dead.